The Teleological Argument by William Paley. William Paley was an Anglican priest, eventually bishop, philosopher, and Christian apologist. William Paley offered an argument for God's existence that differs than previous arguments in that it was an argument by analogy. So what Paley attempted to do was prove God's existence by looking at objects in the real world. His sort of classic example was a watch and showing that the reasoning that goes into our view that the watch must have been made by some being, some person, is or can apply to our arguments for the idea that by looking at the universe, we can infer that the universe was made by God. So the basics of the argument are very simple. Paley was offering a very straightforward, what might many might say is just a common sense argument for God's existence that's based on this sort of empirical reasoning. So the basics of the argument goes just like this. A watch is to a watchmaker as the universe is to a universe maker. So as you'll note from the reading, what Paley said is if you were walking through the forest and you came across a pocket watch and you looked at that pocket watch, there's a couple of assumptions you could make. One, you might make the assumption that there must have been metal and glass and wind and rain and other things, all that just over time through erosion and the natural forces made all of these things coalesce into a pocket watch. That's one possible explanation. Now that seems really unlikely, says Paley. If I'm walking through the forest and I see a watch, the first thing I'm going to think is not that this is a naturally occurring thing. So it's not as if I'm walking through the forest and see a flower growing or I see a tree or I see grass then I would assume that that might be naturally occurring in the forest. But something like a watch clearly indicates that there's something else going on, just the complexity of the watch alone. How could natural forces put this together? Unlike when I look at trees or plants where I could easily see how natural forces could spread, say, the seeds of an oak tree. So if I had one oak tree and I come back a year or two later and I see a small oak tree, I say, oh, well, it's clear that the, the bigger tree... Um, one of the seeds must have you know, gotten into the ground and through rain and water and so forth grew. But I wouldn't make that same assumption if I looked at a pocket watch. So what Paley says is when I look at the universe, how is it or why is it that I would infer from this that all of this order that we see in the universe just came about randomly, just simply by chance? So what Paley says, if, if I look at the watch and from that watch, I get the idea of a watchmaker, why wouldn't that same inference work when I look at the physical world around me. And that's the total essence of his argument is that analogy, that the watch is to a watchmaker, that that type of craftsmanship is similar to the craftsmanship that would go into making a universe. And we can see what he means by the sort of craftsmanship of the universe, right? So there, there are laws of nature, for example. We know objects fall at a certain rate towards the earth. We can measure distance and velocity. We know things act with regularity, right? The earth revolves around the sun. The earth spins. It's 24 hours in a day. There's a regularity to things in nature. We have physics and chemistry and so forth. And all of those things seem to operate according to laws. And these things don't seem random or arbitrary. And so the teleological argument is simply that. It's to say, well, if the universe shows this kind of regularity, this kind of design, then there must have been a designer. Now, the modern form of this argument is the intelligent design. So some of you may have heard of the idea of intelligent design. It was a pretty controversial sort of view um, that many were advocating in various states that this be included in, in biology. And the idea of intelligent design, which is a modern form of the teleological argument, is that when we look at certain things in nature, so take the human eye, for example, if you remove any part of the human eye, if you remove the cones or rods or the lens and so forth, the eye just ceases to function, right? It no longer does what the eye is supposed to do. And this, what intelligent design advocates would say is this irreducible complexity, that this thing, you can't make it any less complex without losing the purpose of that thing. And so therefore, the eye must have been designed. 
right? It couldn't have just formed over time in stages. So if we think of an evolutionary sort of um, stages, that couldn't have happened. It must have been put in place, fully developed, all the parts working in unison so that the eye does what the eye is supposed to do. So this teleological argument, even in its modern day version, which is very similar, by the way, to, to Paley's, is still something that resonates with people today. So there's still discussion as to whether or not the intelligent design or the teleological argument actually does give us grounds for believing in the existence of God. Now, as I've emphasized elsewhere, the God that Paley's talking about is the Judeo-Christian conception of God. So those like Paley who were advocating for proof for God's existence, as we see with Anselm and Aquinas as well, they weren't advocating for any kind of God. They were advocating for a particular type of God. And so this, by the way, will then raise several questions if we take this analogy seriously. So let's assume for a minute that we are going to take the teleological argument seriously. We're going to say, yes, I can see that if I were walking through a forest and I saw, say, you know, a cell phone on the ground, my first assumption wouldn't be that that cell phone developed naturally through natural forces or causes. I would immediately assume that there was someone who had created that. Now, it might be somebody in another country, maybe manufactured, designed in California and manufactured in China or designed in Korea and manufactured in China. I mean, wherever we want to say it comes from, the, the point being, we wouldn't assume that it came from, you know, water and rain and wind, eventually all these elements coming together as that phone. So let's take this argument seriously. So if we want to ask whether this is in fact a good analogy, because note that, we, as we mentioned before, arguments by analogy can be tricky. If the two things are dissimilar enough, then the argument doesn't work. Also, it might be the case that this argument doesn't do what Paley and others would like it to do. So to begin, we might ask, does this argument give good grounds for God, God's existence, or a number of God's existence? So no, let's go back to the watchmaker example. If I'm walking through the forest and I see a pocket watch, and I see that pocket watch has, say, a gold case, and then it has gears made of steel and a spring. And then it's going to have a glass face on top of that. And maybe it's got a face that's been painted. If I look at all those elements of the watch, is it the case that the watchmaker made all of those things? Or is it possible the watchmaker got those parts from others, from other watchmakers? So in other words, maybe there's somebody who makes the case. And there's somebody who makes the glass, right? Melts the sand down into glass and polishes it. Maybe there's somebody who creates the paint. Somebody who um, takes the metal out of the earth and transforms it into pieces that the watchmaker can use to craft into gears. Well, if that's the case, if the watchmaker isn't creating the entire watch from scratch, and our notion is that most watchmakers don't do everything from scratch, then it's possible there are multiple watchmakers. So if we think about other views on God or the gods. So if we look at Greek mythology or the Egyptian gods or the Norse gods or um, the polytheism that we find in India, although some argue it's possibly not polytheism, but we'll set that aside for a minute. The idea that there are multiple gods might also follow from this. So the question is whether the teleological argument does for Paley what Paley wanted it to do, right? Does it prove the existence of a god or does it prove the existence of multiple gods, right? So I could look at the universe and say, wow, something as complex as the universe. Perhaps there was a God that dealt with the physics of the universe, and there was the God that dealt with the physical material in the universe, or a God that dealt with nature or natural forces right, versus the subatomic forces and so forth and so on. So again, the teleological argument might be somewhat convincing, but note that it might prove too much. In other words, too many gods, right? If your intention was to prove just one Judeo-Christian, you know, Muslim conception of God. The other thing that the teleological argument does is it brings up the grounds for believing in a perfect God, right? So if I look at the classic sort of notion, again, going back to that sort of Judeo-Christian conception of God, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and God is, in some sense, a 
a perfect being, right? But then I look at the world, at the creation. So here's what this perfect craftsman, craftsperson God has done. And I see things like disease and sickness. And I see social unrest or injustice and war and something like the Holocaust. And I look at that world and I say, if this is if this is the world created by God, is this God actually a perfect God? Couldn't God have done better in a world? So if, if I look at a watch and I see that the watch doesn't tell time very well or it's constantly breaking down or it doesn't work at all, let's say I wind this watch I found in the forest and it doesn't work, then that's not a particularly good watch. Well, if the world isn't a particularly perfect place or a good place, then doesn't that cast doubt on the nature of God? So again, it might prove that there's a God, or it might prove there's multiple gods. It might prove there's a being who created everything, but it also might note that that being wasn't particularly good at creation, right? That it, it allowed for a number of things that you and I would think of as imperfections, right? We think of a perfect world in one in which there's social justice, a perfect world in one in which, you know, there isn't disease, or that in which millions weren't killed during the Holocaust, or where there wasn't in a constant state of war somewhere in the world. All of these sort of are in line with the teleological argument, right? I look at the world as an example. How am I, how am I supposed to figure out the characteristics of the watchmaker? I look at the creation, just like, or I look at the watch, just like when I want to find the characteristics of God, I would look at what it was that God made. So I could tell with a watchmaker, the, the attention to detail, and what things were put into the watch. Well, now I could use that same analogy to look at the world. So this then draws into question, what kind of God does a teleological argument actually support? You know, can I judge the imperfections of the world as a characteristic of the divine watchmaker, so to speak? The other thing that the teleological argument does is it gives us grounds for questioning, does God actually interact with creation? So note, once I create the watch and I wind it up, what need is there for the watchmaker anymore, right? So you can think of an infinite spring, right, where you've wound the watch and you wind up that spring. If you think of creation as sort of needing a push in motion, but there's enough force there for it to continue, does the watchmaker example, by analogy, mean that God doesn't interact with creation anymore? So in other words, God wound up creation set it on its way, and then just walked away, much like a watchmaker, right? The watchmaker makes the watch, sells it to someone else, and then is done with that thing that they've created. And so while the standard conception of God in most of the, again, Judeo-Christian Muslim conceptions is that God is an active participant in the world, right? Actively engages in the world. The watchmaker example, though, if I'm really going by analogy, could it be that God just sets things in motion and is then indifferent to what happens after that, right? Or is letting creation wind down, right? So there's different views on the universe, whether the universe will expand in, in sort of indefinitely. And if it keeps expanding, will it pull itself apart? The other one is the universe expanding fast enough so that it won't collapse back on itself. So perhaps God put the universe in motion and eventually this thing is going to wind down in one way or another, right? It's either going to sort of pull itself apart or smack back together, or will it just continue to go? Is there enough in the spring, say, for the universe to keep going? But note that the teleological argument doesn't give us any guidance on this, right? If it proves a God, it proves that God may or may not be um, perfect. It proves that God may or there may be more than one God. Um, it, pr it may note that God isn't perfect, Right, that there's a problem with the creation, and it might think that there are grounds for thinking that God no longer interacts with the world. In fact, there were many, um, the early founding fathers, many of them were deists. And the deist version, which buys into a teleological account, says, yes, of course there was a creator, and there's a creator that put all this together, put it all in motion, but no longer interacts with that creation. Right, Everything that's needed is in the creation, and God sort of steps aside and just allows creation to do what it's going to do. So the teleological argument in some ways is compelling, and the, the modern-day versions of the teleological argument, intelligent design, um, some people have found very compelling, although the evidence generally counts against it. So even if we go to a more complex version of the teleological argument we find with intelligent design, 
that those things that are viewed as irreducibly complex, um, most biologists, most scientists have been able to show how these very complex things in fact developed from less complex things, even though you wouldn't expect that they would. So the teleological argument for some is overly simplistic. In other words, this argument from analogy with the watch breaks down. Uh, on the other hand, it also raises so many questions that if we take the argument seriously, that it really might overprove certain things for them. So in other words, it might just say, no, no, there's more than one God, or God isn't really a participant in the universe. And that's not exactly what Paley and other Christian apologists, of course, would be looking for, right? They're attempting to prove that God exists. So a number of these, a number of these objections are what sort of undermine most appeals to the teleological argument. And we'll see one of the most, um, one of the most damning, for lack of a better term, um, arguments against God's existence, or at least against the standard Judeo-Christian conception, will come from the problem of evil, which we've mentioned here, right? When you look at creation and evil in the world, and that sort of is an offshoot where we see a separate approach to a question about God and the nature of God. So the problem of evil will be something we'll also be discussing. So that's the teleological argument. Again, it's not particularly complex. It's very simply straightforward. It's comparing the watch with the watchmaker to the universe with the universe maker, and then just says, let's take that analogy seriously, and doesn't that prove the existence of a divine being, namely God?